Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Sherry Riker Falou, author of Say It Now, 33 Creative Ways to Say I Love You to the Most Important People in Your Life. And I am so excited today. This is gonna be an amazing, amazing hour that we have Monk and Rachel. You guys wanna give a little wave just so they can find you on the screen. And we're gonna be talking about finding center in chaos. And I know it's a very timely topic in so many ways and so many different kinds of chaos and so many different ways to find center. And I can't wait to hear what Rachel and Monk bring to us. And so to get started, I think we'll have, um, Monk, why don't you start us off and just give us a little bit of an overview about who you are, where you are, and you know, tell us about your books. Okay. I'm Monk Yunro. Uh, I was born Arthur Rosenfeld many moons ago. I was ordained a decade or so ago as a monk in, in uh, China, a Taoist monk, and I use that name now. I'm the author of, I, I've lost track a little bit, 20 something books, um, two with Mango and two more with Mango coming, and then uh, many others with other publishers, but I'll show you quickly some covers so you can know as I was requested to do. <laughs> uh, this is a Mad Monk Manifesto, which I'll read a little bit from today. Uh, this is a more recent mango title, Turtle Planet, which has got the similar message, but uh, instead of the bitter herb, it's the strawberry milkshake with the herb dropped in so you don't know you're getting medicine. Uh, this is a recent novel, uh, came out probably after the other two, Mistress Meow, uh, Chinese history and fantasy and love story and serial killer. Uh, and um, <laughs> uh, right, so I spend my time um, about 60% uh, writing books and uh, the rest of it practicing and teaching Taoist arts under normal circumstances around the world and currently um, on Zoom. Love it. And I know that Monk is gonna be reading us a little something in, in a few minutes, but let's go ahead and have Rachel. Let's have you introduce yourself. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. I am Rachel Wolf. I'm the author of Letters from a Better Me, How Becoming an Empowered Woman Transforms the World from Mango Publishing. And I have a daily blog called From a Loving Place that I do. It's um, the, the daily piece I do right now is called Daily Aligning with Love, Abundance, and Peace. And I do seminars and workshops and uh, Zoom events all <laughs> right now, a lot of those. <laughs> so I love it. Um, most of my work revolves around perspective and how it can either keep us prisoner or set us free and, and making the conscious choice of how to shift from that unconscious mind that we work in autopilot to being conscious to be able to empower ourselves. I love it. And Rachel, why don't you tell us, I think this is okay to say, but I just love, you were so excited when we knew Monk was gonna be coming on and you, you reached out to me and you said, oh, I wanna be there with, with Monk. Well, why was that? Well, from the first meeting and realizing he was a Taoist monk, um, I, I have always, the reading that I've read, read multiple versions of the Tao, I've studied like different studies of the Tao. And so, and it reflects in a lot of my work. So just to be on with someone who has made it their lifestyle, <laughs> you know, it was very exciting to me um, just to be able to be in this conversation. So I am so grateful to be here. Oh, well, I'm so happy to have both of you here. And I know that you both brought uh, a little something to read to start us off. And we'll go back to Monk and let, let's hear it. So um, I, I actually want to say something before I read to sort of frame <clears throat> the conversation or at least my remarks, because the topic is uh, center in chaos. Um, and I may have a bit of a different framing than some other people. So I want to make sure that before I read, everybody knows a little bit more about where I'm coming mm. from here. 
not in a particularly loquacious way, but just quickly. So <clears throat> there is a bit of a prejudice against spirituality when it comes to practical solutions. There seems to be in the West, particularly this idea that, you know, there's things we do to get through the day and then there's that spiritual stuff. And if you have time to do that kind of stuff, that's great. But, you know, it's not going to really help you right now how to get this done or that done or how to survive this or that. And uh, Taoism is a very practical philosophy, really a little bit more than a religion, maybe a bit of both. And um, so I want to remark that the very first thing that very first spiritual experience that anybody ever has, and this might be upon emer emerging into the world as an infant, very first thing is the perception that something is going on. And when you realize that something is going on, if you spend a little time thinking about it, you realize very quickly too, that you have absolutely no idea what it is and that you are never going to have any idea what it is, regardless of how many Hubble space telescopes or cork crackers we develop, no matter our level of technology, it's a Western conceit that at some point with our brains and our instruments and our artificial intelligence, we will divine the nature of everything and what's really going on. And this to a Taoist is a laughable, if not offensive proposition. So recognizing that we have no idea what's going on, we can reframe the idea of chaos. Mm. So rather than talk about chaos, we can say uh, normal, it's just exactly what it always is, stuff going on that I don't understand, that I will never understand. And once we get to that spot, it is a short jump to relinquishing the desire to control or understand. And therein is the very first and most accessible and important step to finding center. So that's the preamble I wanted to give to any reading. Thank you so much for that. That was a great, great place to start. So Sherry, you asked me to read something about finding center or dealing with chaos. And I'm choosing uh, Mad Monk Manifesto is a series of paragraphs, really, ideas that are grouped together in themes. And in chapter two, which is called Rebalancing Daily Life, I have the following very prosaic and down to earth little paragraph. And it's about something we all have to do every day and that is drive, drive your car. Drive steadily and slowly. Being behind the wheel is an opportunity to be courteous to others and to do them a favor. Let others go first. Find the flow of the road and stick to it. Move effortlessly and without drawing attention to yourself in any way. Rushing about, craving the feeling of acceleration and gaining superficial satisfaction from taking or achieving advantage on the road are all signs of a disquieted mind. The primary goal of any drive is to arrive safely. So very many people can't and don't. Is chortling about beating someone to a parking place or self-righteously forcing them off the road really the way we want to treat others and have others treat us? How much better is it to be compassionate and helpful to others on the road, to show you are aware of them as people, not just drivers, as humans and not merely cars with faceless operators and poor? Next time you get behind the wheel, why not use the opportunity to relax and see if you can't find new ways to show you care for those with whom you share that road. Oh, Monk, thank you so much. That, I don't know about anyone else, but I just felt myself already just breathing more deeply. And, and I, love, I love that you chose to, that passage, and, and to really bring in that care for others, that we're not the only ones on the road. <laughs> I love that. 
Rachel, before you read, I'm wondering if there's anything that you want to say in response to what Monica. You would have thought we would have planned our readings together. Um, <laughs> because, you know, the, one of the things that is so important to me too is finding the things that we're already doing and making it a place where we can recenter and, and to pay attention. And uh, yeah, I love the way you wrote that too, because it, it just puts you there. It, it got me in the car. It got me thinking about that drive. And I love that. So mine <laughs> is uh, the section's called Centering. Uh, it's centering ourselves first is essential for being peaceful within our own psyche. If we don't center ourselves, we can go into instant autopilot. I've been guilty of saying I don't have enough time to dot, 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 whatever I could be doing better for myself. Centering ourselves with what we are already, what we already do daily is a great start. We can start with a stretch where we focus on how our body feels as we reach up to the sky and lunge from side to side. We can practice gratitude in the mirror as we get ready for, the, for our day. While eating, we can slow down and pay attention to the food in our mouths. We choose the food we do for a reason. Take the time to taste it. We can use our senses to feel the sensations and textures. Taste the food moving around in our mouths and going into our body. Judgments about food and feelings of guilt, shame, or obligation are not in the present moment. We have to be present to enjoy what we are putting into our mouths. Do you have a dog? Here's a great opportunity to become centered. While you're walking a dog, look around, look up, look down, Listen to nature and note. What do you see and hear? Are there birds? Is there wind? Tune into the breeze. Where do you feel it? How does it feel? Is it cool or warm? If it's raining, what does that feel like against your skin? When we are present and centered, we instinctually know what our bodies, what our bodies are asking for. The relationship to nurturing the body becomes peaceful. And it all starts with simply being conscious and present, present. The more centered we are, the more we want to do what is best for ourselves. It is natural and not forced. When we are forcing ourselves to do what is best for our self-care, we are stuck in internal wars, creating violence from within. We are fighting or feeling deprived. When we stop fighting, and start loving, we end the war. When we end the war, our bodies stop responding as though we are attacking them. Mm. So, you know, and um, I always have a section after for going deeper, you know, where I just try to help people take whatever I wrote about and take it a step deeper for their own practices because you know, I know for me, when I'm, when I lose center, I get overwhelmed anyway. And so thinking of adding something else to my day to recenter me overwhelms me more. So doing the things that I'm already doing, like thinking of doing driving consciously and thinking of somebody else, that would be a great practice for me because I'm already doing it anyway. And so it doesn't add that additional stress and it doesn't feel like an additional pressure of an already overwhelmed feeling, you know, from the, that piece. So I love that. Yeah, it, it's so beautiful that you both chose readings that really, you know, it just planted us where we already are, of course. And Rachel, one of my favorite things that I learned from you is the hand washing meditation. And I always think of you because of that, you know, washing my hands all day long, all the time. And, you know, again, something that we're already doing. Yeah. Monk, I'm curious, did you have anything that you wanted to say in response? Uh, 
The next novel I've got coming out is a novel called Yang, like yin and yang, Y-A-N-G. And in that book, which is the story of a, a little jade and gold robot built at the time of Kublai Khan as a gift for his barren first wife to be a substitute child, this uh, little clockwork being becomes quite conscious and hyper-conscious really and discourses from time to time because he himself is a clockwork animal about the tyranny of the clock and the tyranny of time. So one way that we make ourselves and other people miserable is to have an obsession with the time. Hmm. I only have so much time to do this. I only have to, you know, by this four o'clock at 2.30, I got to be at this meeting, all right? And many people will obsess about the time and the schedule of the day or the week long before it occurs. And in that way are being cruelly controlled by it and allowing that. So insofar as we are able to do so, disconnecting from that kind of precision, which on the surface seems to be a good thing because it is connected to the false god of productivity and other Western ills, poisons which destroy who and what we are. If we're managing to control our response to the clock, to have an ease around when and where we show up and what we do, and to not think of our accomplishments so, such as they may be during the day as connected to the clock, we take a big step towards lowering anxiety and gaining and regaining control of our life. I love that when you started with that um, passage about driving and, and what you're saying just now, what I just connected, like I'm thinking of who I am when I leave myself so much time to get somewhere, right? I'm so much kinder. It's so gentle, it's so enjoyable versus like what you were just saying, that precision of time and, and how and who I am in that. That really struck me. So there is a, there is a Taoist idea of effortless living, mm. way, way. And it describes a way of being that accords with a sensitivity to the natural way that things unfold in nature and the study of how those things unfold so as to align ourselves with forces larger than we are and schedules and cycles that are beyond our control so that we don't end up warring with them and we end up being more effective with less effort. So for example, if we go back to the driving, if you have somewhere to be and you leave the house and you go there, if you are obsessing constantly during your drive about the time you have to arrive and looking at the clock, the irony is you will not get there any sooner. You will not change any kind of fundamental or real outcome in the real world. All you will have done is spent that 25 minutes torturing yourself. And if you decide that you absolutely must gain 30 or 40 seconds, then you are likely to be imperiling your own life and limb and those of people around you. In any case, um, there is no clock and there is no time in the sense of what's on your wrist or in your phone. Time, if you really wanna understand it and align yourself with it, is the thing that defines us most but not because of the digits on your, on your smartphone. We are not creatures of place or emotion or spirit or anything else. We're actually creatures of time. The single most defining thing about us is that we are born, we get old, we get sick and we die. And those things are measured by time. Time is the arbiter of that human experience. Rachel, you want to hop in? Yeah, um, it's interesting because, you know, one of the ways I started to see how chaotic I was, was my obsession with time, like you were talking about. 
I remember being in a time in my life where I would look at my watch constantly and be counting time. Like I have to be here in this, you know what I mean? And I was constantly counting and calculating and I missed the present moment all the time because I was constantly figuring out where else I had to be next or what I had to do next, what was on the next pace of the timeline. And um, the best thing I ever did for myself was get rid of my watch, you know? And when I had to leave somewhere, I set the timer on my phone to go off right when I needed to be ready to go so that I didn't waste my present moments by worrying or thinking about the time. I knew I was safe. And, and I realized later that my time obsession came from traumatic, you know, traumatic experiences that I was trying to have control, you know, and I'm sure as Monk knows, when we think that we have that control, we make ourselves even crazier. And uh, when it comes to that, and when I released that, it did just so much for me. And you know, it's part of what really helps me today is to realize that the more centered and present I am, the more I'm able to do in a conscious way. It, like I, I'm not, cause I can be where I am. I can be where my feet, my feet were. Um, that was one of my favorite sayings that my friend would always tell me um, when I was really struggling in my spirals as she goes be where your feet are where are your feet <laughs> and it just really helped me always okay breathe and get back to center breathe and get back to center be with my feet and that's you know how I came up with um the hand washing meditation Sherry that you were talking about where you know I could really just be with my hands, be with the water touching my hands and feeling everything and smell and taking in the smells and, and then being so grateful mm. in that moment because I could be there, <laughs> you know? And uh, yeah, so in, in realizing that when I stopped fighting, when I stopped working against myself, my life opened up, you know, even with weight loss and everything, you know, I found that when I worked against, cause mm. I was fighting for, and it's just like the time it's, I, I kept thinking of what I didn't like where I wasn't mm -hmm. instead of being where I am and appreciating getting to walk and appreciating getting to where my feet were and, and what I was doing with the time that I was living. So thank you, Monk. Mm -hmm. Bring in so time. I, I, I have this thought about reframing the relationship with time. It's um, something you can do like reframing the relationship with the ground or with gravity. So in my Tai Chi classes, I, I talk about cultivating a a relationship with gravity that re involves kind of a deal and the deal is, you know, gravity, you're going to win in the end. I'm going to be in a box or ashes in the ground and you'll have me. Until that time, and we, we agree that you're going to win. Just want to make a deal. As a martial arts guy, let me offer you this person or that person to the ground instead of me. And... As far as my own structure and alignment, can you exert your tender force on me in my structure and allow me to stay upright and walk comfortably through the day, feeling that you're having a bit of me as I relax into the ground, but not all of me, which you will, of course, eventually get. <laughs> so, so it is too with time, you know, we can reframe the way we look at it. So rather than obsessing about the effects of it and the misery of it and its control of us and all the rest of it, we can say, you know, what constructive, amusing, and helpful, maybe even healthful game can I play with time 
that gives me pleasure and relaxation instead of worry and stress. Mm. So the Taoist concept of Wei Wu Wei, the idea of this effortless living for maximum result, I play little games sometimes in my uh, COVID incarceration in my house uh, where I, I think about, if I have to walk from one end to the, from, of the house to the other, think about, is there something that right now needs to be in the kitchen? Are there some little glasses that I could pick up because I'm going there anyway? Hmm. And this is neither a stressful nor compulsive thing. It's rather kind of fun. I see, aha, uh -huh, look at this. Uh, an empty bottle, gotta go, <laughs> uh, you know? And so I, I make my meandering from one end of the house to the other, replete with little stops where and I pick up and I take, and of course this is a way of gently playing with time because if I didn't do that, then each one of those things that have to go to the kitchen would require an energetically consumptive and time occupying separate trip. So if I can take six or eight things, then I have this period where I'm just, look at this. <laughs> There's nothing that needs to go to the kitchen. So this is a way of toying with time. And I find it, you know, maybe diagnosed as OCD, but I find it, you know, quite, quite entertaining and relaxing. I love that. And, and Monk, it's funny because when I was meditating this morning, Rod literally just dropped in. I, I, I knew I was gonna go to the post office, but it dropped in. I'm cooking dinner tomorrow and I know what I'm making. So it dropped in. Oh, the grocery store is just five minutes away from the post office. So I think it's, and I was so delighted, you know, I was so delighted that life gave me that because otherwise in my frantic mind, I would have gone to the post office today and gone to the grocery tomorrow. But now I'm so excited to have, I, I love the way that you framed it as a game. So, so one more thought about this. Um, the awareness that is required for you to be thinking about the dinner that you're planning and the shopping that you need to do for that dinner in, on your way to the post office. We have um, a way of looking at what we do with the mind to see more with the same eye. Mm. So if you think of your attention as a zoom lens and you realize that most of the time you have it dialed into the macro where you're looking at an insect's leg, that is the various and sundry vicissitudes of your own little private hell that you've constructed for yourself. Instead, if you take your lens and you dial it out, so that not only do you see all the little errands you've got to do today and which store you have to go to, but also you see the whole town. And you keep on cranking out the lens until you see the whole state and maybe the whole country and then maybe the whole planet. And then you keep on going with your zooming out until you see the earth is just this little that famous blue marble floating there, a rock in space. And you keep on going further until you see the solar system and the galaxy. And you keep on going as far as your mind will allow in that little exercise, you realize that whether or not you forgot the cornstarch in your trip to the grocery store is actually not the world's biggest deal. Rachel, I thought you might have something. I was giving you a little space. Oh, I just love that. It, it, it's true. It's, 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 you just, I just see myself <laughs> in, that, in that. And uh, yeah, you know, one of the reasons I've become really into writing the daily, daily aligning with love, abundance, and peace, it's choosing that over fear, lack, in separation. And so every day I'm picking a topic to be grateful for and then I make a commitment to myself that day. 
Mm. And it could be for those minutes. It can be for a period of time that day. It's just reminding me to be conscious of something that can have me align with love, abundance, and peace. And um, when I get into the chaotic mind of that doing and like, like getting crazy, acting like that, you know, forgetting that cornstarch is the worst possible thing in the world. <laughs> you know, it's, it's that reminder to go, okay, why, you know, I'm going into that fear, lack and separation energy. And um, I can sit back and watch it as the observer of it now, where I used to be in the box. I, you know, and my, uh, once again, when I was in my chaos, one of my friends told me, the directions to get outside of the box are on the outside of the box. So only by going to the outside and oh. stepping back and giving that chaos space, could I like separate myself from it so that I could see it for what it was. So I could see that it was not <laughs> the end of the world for getting an item at the store. So I could see that, you know, and even, you know, now going through all the times we're going through and everything that's happening, I can, by focusing on love, abundance, peace over that fear, lack and separate, I can step back and go, okay, how am I viewing things right now? What's perspectives am I choosing to view this scope in? Because knowing that's up to me, how I'm viewing, like, Really, you know, and I think Monk is right on with making it all a like make it in a game so we can so I can laugh at myself about it because that can instantly shift me, you know, into that space again. And I and, you know, awareness is such an important part to stepping stepping out of that box and just to be able to see that we're not that we're not that swirly mess. <laughs> You know, if we can just remove ourselves from that and just look at it from a distance and go, what energy am I, for me, it's asking myself, what energy am I aligning with in this moment? And that helps me instantly get back to center by taking some deep breaths and understanding I'm, I'm just not in the energy and I just, it helps me move by becoming aware of it. But I love the game idea. I need to play more games. <laughs> I, I love the, the idea of laughing at it more. So the theme that many of your remarks just now uh, arose, the theme that arose for me listening to your comments was the theme of substitution. And uh, suffering so keenly from ADHD for most of my life, I became aware of the way the brain forces substitution. So for example, when I'm working on a novel, uh, I can be thinking about a scene and describing a scene, writing a scene, and then all of a sudden I'm on the street, physically. I am on the street outside my house, in the middle of the street. And I have absolutely no recollection of going there. I have no reason for being there that I'm consciously aware of. This happens admittedly quite a bit less these days on account of practice and meditation, but it still happens now and then. It used to happen all the time. And what was going on, of course, was that my brain was saying, I, I can't, can't focus on this thing anymore. Hmm. And if you're not listening when I'm telling you I can't, then I'm going to just stop it forcefully, physically by removing you from here. And some part of my unconscious, subconscious brain would take me out to the street. There I'd be. And, you know, Catherine and others are thinking, you know, there's medication for that. And indeed there was. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I wanted to see if I could do without that. So that is a form of substitution, right? That's a form of doing something that is causing you distress 
and substituting, whether you like it or not, something that doesn't cause you distress. So unless you get hit by a car in your wanderings, it's probably better to be out on the street if your brain really can't do what you were forcing it to do. So likewise, if you have a bad habit or a proclivity or a self-destructive tendency, when you feel this kind of thing coming on, you substitute willfully another option and behavior. And this is a very, very simple and effective strategy. You simply are about to do what you know you don't really wanna do or you shouldn't do. And you just don't sit there and engage the myth, the nasty, cruel and pernicious myth of self-control or willpower, which by the way, don't exist. There is no such thing. It's a fantasy of Western culture. Instead, you simply redirect the ship. I'm, I'm gonna break us here for a moment. There's been so much right now and I'm, I'm just wanna open it up to anyone else who's here. And hi, Brenda, I just saw that you joined us. Good to see you. Hello. Brenda's our associate publisher at Mango. And um, yeah, to see if you have something you want to ask or to comment on just to join the conversation, we welcome hearing from you. Brenda, I see you're unmuted. Did you have something or are you just? Oh, I thought you were talking generally. I thought you said hi to me and then oh. you were like everyone and it's so wonderful to see a sea of faces i'm so thrilled about that and would love to hear from others so um i am just waiting for the moment of synchro destiny which i know is coming down <laughs> that's what i'm here for i'm here for the synchro destiny uh you know you missed it it happened like two minutes before you came on oh while i was trying to log on tell me about it <laughs> I forget now, you know, it's not part of sacred okay. destiny to remember we'll all those things. One. We'll have another mm -hmm. one. Monk, why don't you fill in just in case there's anybody here who might not know what that means. So that's actually nothing to do with Taoism and it's not even my own word. I borrowed it from uh, Deepak Chopra. I, I heard him use it 20 odd years ago in a, in a talk he gave in Florida. Um, but it's it's just a cute word, I like it. Uh, so it is, it is the, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to use my definition because I don't really remember his. Uh, it is the spontaneous and maybe titillating and joyful realigning of your perception with the uh, outside world and that outside world. So, for example, your town is full of pink VW beetles. And they're everywhere, but you, for whatever reason, haven't really ever noticed that. And one day you drive around and for whatever reason, you just see, wow, look at that. That's an old vintage beetle, pink. And the minute, the minute you see that pink BW beetle, you, you know, and you drive home, you see six more and you go, whoa, the whole world is VW beetles, right? But, but of course, you know, n none of that is any more or less true than it was before you noticed it. But the phenomenon of noticing it and having this free song of, of some sort of insight, uh, which again is just a function of your filters, is the thing. By the way, I might add on that subject, because it's very important to grasp this as we talk about these kinds of things, that the human brain's primary function is not what everybody in the Western scientific world says it is, that is the maintenance of homeostasis or what all of our self-help books suggest it is, as you know, the finding of food and shelter and a mate and all that stuff. Actually, the primary function of the human brain is filtration. So before you can do anything, find food, navigate your way through the room, your house, the world, before you can do any of those so-called basic functions, your brain has to allow you to filter the incomprehensibly large and constant deluge of input 
whether it's visual input and all the different light waves that our brain either can't, our eyes can't see, or we see but don't recognize, you know, consciously. And the same thing for chemo sensation and the same thing for smell, touch, temperature, and on and on and on. If we were, and, and this is what my, my poor little teenage brain suffered so badly from with ADHD is that I, you know, I had a filter problem and that I would very rapidly become overwhelmed by things as part of that syndrome still happens, which is why I live a quiet life. But if we, if we recognize that the brain's primary function is that filtration and we decide, wow, you know, I'd like to willy nilly remove those filters and see things more deeply than we try ayahuasca or we try peyote or we try LSD or we try mushrooms and on and on. And then we have an uncontrolled so-called psychedelic experience in which filters are removed and we may or may not like what we see. Mm. And we may or may not have a panic feeling of loss of control. The path of practice is the path of systematically and in a deliberate constructed fashion, removing the filters, the ones you want to remove, the ones you need to remove so that you can see the world in a way that is constructive and helpful for you. Mom, can you say just a little more about that? Like if if you would, like I would love to hear what might some of those filters be that we would systematically choose to remove? Racial prejudice. Mm -hmm. We see the, the filter constructs a way that we see. Yeah. So how we see color, how we see culture, how we see gender, those things are, are applied filters. They don't have anything to do with the fundamental basic reality of what's going on. That's just ingrained in us. And you know, a lot of the filters that we have are neurologically applied. They're, they're things in our evolution. But there are also many other filters which are more accessibly reprogrammed, removed, or tweaked that are cultural and societal filters. So we talked about this a lot, but we didn't characterize this this way in this conversation. One of those things was the way we talked about time. Yeah. Another thing was the reframing of um, you know, how we move through the day and what efficiency and uh, effectiveness could be without effort. These are all different ways of seeing the exact same thing. And this is a very, very rich vein to mine. But it is the path of there are only two ways to get to these things. One is to spontaneously pop your cork like the prophets of old, to have the top of your head blow off and suddenly you are able to understand things. Your Jesus and your father is talking to you or your Moses and the bush is burning. You're Muhammad and you're hearing the voice of God. And, and you just, and there, Taoism is full of immortals who had similar sort of um, what a modern physician might call um, schizophrenic episodes in which voices were in their heads telling them things. And then with the seeing and understanding that came from that, their impulse was to share. And the moment you go from experience to communicating, as natural and important as that may be, most, if not all, is lost. So for those of us who can't pop our cork and didn't have the top of our head blown off by some kind of genetic anomaly or some kind of traumatic or inspirational experience, the only other way to get at this filter work is the path of practice. And that is where we follow an established way that people have used before to do exactly that and be patient through its stages. I hey. love it. Oh, sorry. No, I was just gonna invite you, I was just gonna invite you in. Uh, I love everything you're saying. And, and it just, it reminds me of why I started seeing the world the way I did. I started looking at things as perspectives of truth instead of 
tying myself so tightly to something that was painful to me, a belief that was so painful, uh, pretty much like a filter, what you're saying is a filter, what you're calling a filter. And I would see it as a perspective of truth that I'm choosing to live in. And it could be based on the generations of family before me that passed down the patterns, but to understand that it still was a filter, like you were saying, a filter. For me, I say it's, pat, you know, it's those patterns that I needed to find habits to break up to introduce new ways that felt better. And for me, I like to understand other people's perspective. This is why I like studying all different things and all different religions and all different sides of politics and all different sides of people. It's because I like to know there's different perspectives that I can choose. Mm -hmm. For me, that feels freeing that I anything that isn't working in my life, I don't have to keep. <laughs> I don't have to keep things that make me feel miserable. I don't have to keep those filters, patterns, you know, whatever that tie me down. And for me, it's what I talk about in all my seminars is, is that's the things that would make me feel prisoner, you know? And so if I want to be free from that, I have to see it first, you know? And when I can see these things, and become aware of them at first and then can say and, and see them as a perspective, not as I have to do it because this is the way it was done before. I have, you know, it, it's like, I'm, tra I'm not trapped in it. I'm not a prisoner of it anymore. And once I can see that, I can try things that help me break that pattern and, or, you know, clean that filter <laughs> out completely so that I can, I can go into the habits. Um, <clears throat> you know, I am a person that will try multiple things and I give a lot of options to people too is because I know not everything worked for me, you know? And so I try to see it as this didn't work for me, but hey, it may work for you because it's worked for other people. And, um, but understand, but see, one of the biggest things for me was realizing that when something didn't work, I don't have to self abuse myself. Mm -hmm. I don't have to self blame. And um, I can just take accountability and responsibility for what's mine, and then learn from it and move on. And that took a lot of that angst and, and that prisoner feeling from me so that I could shift and break down those filters and walls you know i i because i study so many things i hear so many different ways of saying it but i love that to me it all represents the same thing because i see it as that clearing mm. clearing out what doesn't work so i always enjoy hearing a different perspective so i love it <laughs> And so I to me to here, know. there's um, there's the why and there's the how. The why is why mess with our filter. <clears throat> why do you why do you have an interest in examining, understanding, or shedding filters? And the answer has to be that it will serve you and others in some way. If not, don't do it. Don't bother then it's just becomes a sort of masturbatory exercise and consciousness altering, which isn't really fruitful. Mm. The how is a, is a different question. And in this, uh, Rachel, I, I slightly differ from you because I am wary of the trap of seeing too many different options and casting too wide a net, which in the end catches no particular edible fish. So, I, I would, having done that earlier in my life, I feel like settling on one, whichever one you like, and going deeper rather than broader is probably going to be for most people a more effective strategy. I'd like to ask, um, or actually make a comment on something. Um, um, Robert Colbert out of Minneapolis, 
And, you know, I was thinking that it's nice to have rules in life. It's nice to have ways to approach things. Uh, but, and, and so one of the things that um, I have is a martial arts background and, and a Tai Chi background. So I like the Taoism kind of approach where you've got these two poles that um, have a different perspective that you have to somehow balance. And that always, it made me think of the idea that, you know, what would have happened if you would have changed this title to uh, Finding Chaos in Center? And what would that have meant uh, to this conversation? And, and, and it really makes me think, you know, what, you know, everybody's kind of been talking about it. What do you embrace? What do you let go of? Uh, what, what, what kind of things come into play? And so, so to me, there's a certain sense of, you know, when you're on that fine line of that yin and yang, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in there. There's a lot of unknown. It's a pathless journey. And so you're trying to find your way. So, you know, I just, you know, it, it almost sounds like in a way, uh, we're, we're acting like chaos is kind of the thing that's throwing us off. And, and I'm just, I just wanted to turn it around and say, well, you know, where, where are we here? And, and, and I, I just that conversation between, you know, Monk and, and Rachel right now kind of talking about, you know, is, you know, focus in or versus, you know, kind of, you know, really try to, you know, get everything. I, I don't know if there's one way to do anything. I, I think the bottom line is that everybody's got their path. And, and hopefully they get some type of peace of mind out of it. But, um, but I, I just like to kind of hear perspectives on the idea of, you know, what's the, what's the positives of chaos? And, and uh, what's the things you got to let go of chaos? Uh, what's the positive order? You know, what do you got to let go of there? And I'll shut up. <laughs> Thanks, Robert. I can't wait to hear what they say. That was, that was great. That was a great question. I, um, I, I, for me, when chaos enters my life, it's my opportunity. Um, it's my opportunity. I call it my growth spurts. <laughs> so I know that when things are chaotic is where I tend to learn the most um, because it just gives me a, an openness to pay more attention and to listen and to see to see what's really going on inside me. Because when things are calm and peaceful, it's easy for me to be centered. It's easy for me to be grounded. It's easy for me to be present. It's when I am in the chaos that I learn what really is going on, the deeper layers. And sometimes for me, I've um, it's been the biggest blessings because it forces me to go deeper into my journey um, right now, I'm very into the journey of the butterfly. And one of the areas that I wasn't as focused on before was the chrysalis. Like I know the chrysalis is that space, that space of stillness after coming out of the struggle of the caterpillar, after coming out of the fight and the chaos and, the, and going through the muck to get to that peace inside the chrysalis. But then I realized that, that in that chrysalis, everything becomes mush. And so sometimes that chaos shows you where all the mush is. <laughs> and, and, and so it's taken me deeper into that journey of seeing like the chaos of 2020 really helped me see the importance of that chrysalis and, and becoming the mush inside of it and just absorbing and, and taking in um, and learning from what was really going on inside me. It helped me get to deeper layers of triggers that I had that stem from childhood that were resurfacing because of the things that were happening. And so I always find the chaos is a blessing. Um, even if I don't like it, I know I'm gonna learn from it. I, I always say that I'm on that growth spurt and it's my breakdown to break through because I used to think of it as hitting a bottom and that felt very trapping to me. Mm. And I would go into the chaos and I would dig myself to the ground and think, I'm done, I'm, this is it. And now I realize it's just something that once I go, I, can, I break through the other side and I always have a big, huge growth spurt because of it. So thank you for that question. I hope that was my perspective of it. 
And I'd love, I thank you, Rachel. That was really great. And I'd also love to hear from Monk if people can stay just a couple minutes late. I know we're almost at the top of the hour, but it'd be fun to hear from Monk as well. So Robert, first of all, thanks very much for joining us today. I see you on my list and so on. I'm, I'm happy to have a face to put with the name. Um, uh, and also, by the way, let me just as an aside, say hi to Joan, who is an old friend I haven't seen in many years. Thanks for, hi, for showing up. Hi, Joan. <laughs> hi, Monk. Hi, Janelle. <laughs> nice to see you. So, uh, Robert, I want to address this in a way that not only answers your very specific uh, question framed by your Taoist and martial experience, but also in a way that's accessible to everyone else who may not do those things. Um, there is uh, this idea in the Tai Chi Tu, this so-called yin yang uh, symbol that we see on the back of surfers pickup trucks and uh, all around very ubiquitous now in our culture. I'm, I'm wearing some version of it around my neck as I do every day. Um, there is a, there's a very fundamental misunderstanding about what that symbol means. And in the clarification of what that symbol means is some answer to uh, Robert's uh, uh, question and hypothesis. Although we look at that symbol as a fixed and static thing, it is actually a movie. This also pertains to Rachel's preference for seeing wide and my preference for going narrow. They don't exclude each other. In the narrow is the wide and buried in the wide is the narrow. The Tai Chi Tu symbol is a circle because when this symbol, uh, the, the symbol was uh, devised, there were no motion pictures, didn't have video. And so the way that we wanted to evoke in the, coming from the Chinese language, which is pictographic and the brains that we're used to using and writing and reading those symbols understood that these were pictures of processes or things. They were not, it's not an alphabetical language. So the philosophy that arose from that kind of looking at the world had inherent in it some dynamism that is lacking in the alphabet languages and our brains were trained differently. The Tai Chi Tu, that yin yang symbol is circular because the outside layer of the symbol, that circle is designed to evoke motion. It's a movie, not a snapshot. And what the movie is, is the continuous change from yin to yang. Not just that the white fish has a black eye and the black fish has a white eye, which is a, a simpler concept that inside of yin, there's a little bit of yang and vice versa, but not, not just that, but more of larger importance as demonstrated by the fundamental shape of the thing is that this is a dynamic interplay, constantly changing. And in the oldest version of that symbol, there is a round circle in the middle of the other circle. Now I can, I have that symbol on, but I just don't know if the camera will pick it up. But if you can see that, you can see that there's a black circle in the middle of this. That black circle represents the void. It represents the formlessness that we could equate to in the Abrahamic tradition, the cosmogony of what happened in the book of Genesis, how did things appear? Um, and there is a Chinese analog to this, although it is fundamentally different because it's absent a creator. Rather, there is a fundamental aspect to the system that out of nothing came something. And nobody asked who made that happen. That was just inherent in the system. Out of nothing comes something. So when we, this is a nice full circle place for me to end my comments today because that central circle called Wuji, W-U-J-I is the void. And it is what I've called in my writings uh, because I don't have a better way of expressing it. I wish I did. Emptiness pregnant 
with infinite possibility. Mm -hmm. So there is nothing, but everything is about to erupt. All what they called in Chinese, the 10,000 things, and we call the known universe, was about to manifest from this tiny little, you know, big bangish point. Everything was about to happen, but nothing has happened yet. It's still and empty. It's a void. And yet, empty doesn't quite cut it because it's about to be everything. So in that change, in that explosion from nothing to something, the first thing that happens is the immersion, the um, uh, emergence is the word I wanted, of these two poles, the yin and the yang, and their interaction back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, their harmonious interplay of so-called opposing forces. That word in Chinese philosophy and Taoist philosophy is Tai Chi, which is also the word used to describe the martial art that Robert practices. Wow. This is one of those moments where I wish we had 24 hours to just all stay right here and just keep going. I, I, I just loved this. Thank you so much, Rachel and Monk and everyone who's here. Um, just, wow. There, there will be a replay. I feel like this is, this is one that I definitely just want to hear again and again. And so we do post the replays. Um, this is called the, the Heart Wisdom Panel. We're here every Wednesday. Next week, we're gonna be discussing Black Joy in honor of Black History Month. And I think that's also gonna be an amazing conversation. So we welcome you all back. And again, thank you so much, Rachel and Monk. And thank you, Brenda, for Mango and everything you do to bring us all together. And Debbie, thank you so much for helping us so much with all of this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Wonderful to be with you. Bye, Monk. Thank you.